Okay, I think we're good to go. Okay, are we good to go? Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Marco and I'm with uh, Christine and Yogam and we are doing this crashing course of chairing. With this uh, very uh, short uh, presentation, we would like to introduce you to the world of chairing and more specifically, uh, moderating a model European Union debate. Um, the introduction is, as I said, made by uh, me, Christine and uh, Yogam, and we based our, uh, our small introduction, uh, our small presentation, sorry, um, on uh, the one made by Beta Europe some, some years ago. Um, we have mostly three parts. In the first uh, uh, biggest uh, part, we have the presentation uh, itself, where we explain uh, uh, some important uh, things that every chair needs to know and needs to do when it comes to, to be the chair, to be the moderator of the discussion, no matter if it is the moderator of the council or of the parliament. Then we will have um, a short uh, discussion and then a session of uh, question and answers. That, I mean, questions that we, I hope that we will be able to, to, to answer. Um, so I, I'd say, Yogam, you can start on. Thank you, Marco. So um, just to have a little bit of an introduction about who your chairs are. So I'll introduce myself first. So I'm Yogam and I am from Singapore, but I'm studying in Greece for quite some time now. I am doing my PhD political science in one of the universities here. And regarding simulations, I have stopped counting. I think it's the same with Christine and Marco. We don't really know how many we've actually attended because it's way too many. And for chairing wise, I've chaired about five simulations. So that's about me. And uh, I think I'll let Christine and Marco do the introductions also. Christine, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, my name is Christine. I'm from Germany originally, currently living between the Czech Republic and Poland uh, for a while. And I will also be one of the chairs for for Model European Union Strasbourg. This year I participated myself in 2017. It was my first conference and it was very impactful as you see by me still <laughs> being around. Uh, and I'm also vice president of Beta Europe, uh, which is the umbrella organization behind the MEU concept and the Beta network. Um, so if we have some time, maybe we can go into that. But I think for this, for the beginning of this, the chairing should be the, um, yeah, the main focus, I've chaired several conferences, both the EP and the council. I've also been commissioner and in other uh, capacities of the organizing team. So it, it's a, been a really fun journey and I hope we can inspire some of you to, uh, to take a similar path. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Um, the, I am, I'm Marco and I, mm, I will be the president of the European Parliament. Uh, I come from Italy, uh, more specifically from Sicily, Palermo. And uh, I have participated overall to uh, 12 simulations uh, of, the, of the European Union, so 12 model European Union, uh, more um, two or three uh, model United Nations. Uh, I chaired the uh, fifth of them, and uh, I'm here now um, as a, again, as a president of the European Parliament. And uh, yeah, I am just applying for um, a master in PISA and I'm waiting for the results and hopefully I will get uh, selected. Uh, Yogam, please go ahead with, uh, with the start of the presentation. Yes, of course. I think uh, the stream might be lagging a little bit. Okay, so now I think it's finally back in tune, so I will start the presentation. So this is something like we do in chairing also, you have to adapt when things don't necessarily go as what it should. So, so that is something we deal with. And for the role of chairs in a simulation. So basically, if you have actually attended an MEU before, or if you haven't, you might realize that um, one of the things that you actually get is the rules of procedure. 
And when you look at it, it might not necessarily make all the sense to you. It's too many words sometimes can be a little bit intimidating, but I think the role of chess in a simulation to act is actually to bring the rules of procedure to life. You help the participants make sense of it. So we actually apply the rules of procedure. And I think this is very useful to your entire MU experience itself, making sense of the words and putting it into action. And another thing for chairing, of course, is to respect the timetable. If you realize that MU Strasbourg and many other simulations itself, it's very packed. And the chairs are the ones who are actually monitoring the timetable, making sure everything is uh, done in order. So it's not just about making everybody speak when they should, but it's also stopping people when you're running out of time. It's to make sure that everything flows, not just in the parliament, but also in the council. So this coordination is going to be very important, of course. And when you are a chair and a participant, you're often in the session and you see each other the entire time of day. So you're basically the main point of contact between the participants. And of course, in many simulations, often you don't really see the organizers, which is kind of sad because participants often really remember the chairs and their fellow participants. So you actually represent the simulation side of the conference to their participants also. So this would be one of the role of chairs in the simulation. And for responsibility wise, I will also talk a little bit on it before I pass the presentation to Christine. So for responsibility, I would say that chairs, like the rest of the organizers, you also have to enjoy the simulation and ensure that everybody's also enjoying themselves. So the thing is, we have to make sure that everybody's having a good experience. And it's not just a point of authority that you're having, you're also part of the entire how the simulation actually runs and to make sure that participants at the end of the day, they only uh, get the good parts of it and try to minimize the negative parts like the stress and things like that because you're going to be part of the shouldering body for them also. So it's the smooth running of the simulation and to just get everybody on board of the values of MU and to just basically enjoy themselves. So. Okay, so to add on to this, uh, we've already talked about the timetable and the simulation in which obviously the chairs play a very important role. Um, as you know, in MEO conferences, usually we simulate the ordinary legislative procedures. So we have both chambers, the European Parliament and the Council of the EU involved. The European Parliament consisting of, well, MEPs, elected representatives, and uh, the Council consisting of the ministers of the member states. And these uh, chambers are having sessions simultaneously discussing the same things at different times and chairs are essential to make sure that communication between these two chambers functions uh, and that a dialogue is held um, because there are certain times when for example uh, the amendments are uh, approved or the, the final uh, proposal needs to be voted on where it is very important that it's uh, like happening at the same time, especially for the timetable of the simulation rather than uh, in, in reality in the European Union. So uh, the role of the chairs is also to keep flowing the, the information from one chamber to the other. Um, that means, well, cooperation means coordination. Uh, I already mentioned there is a constant uh, stream of communication between the chairs of the EP and of the, of the council. And uh, coordination means that the timetable is good. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, we already said that the timetable is really important to the work of the chair. Uh, the timetable of the conference, the chairs are the ones who basically implement it in practice. Uh, so as I mentioned, it is uh, essential that everybody, all, all the chairs make sure that um, both chambers stick to the timetable. Otherwise, the whole simulation is uh, not going to work out as smoothly and as flawlessly as, uh, as imagined. Okay, and the next slides, um, we have a few words about uh, authority. We will uh, get into this a little bit more into, uh, in the discussion that will follow this presentation. Um, but just to give you an idea, um, of course, as a chair, you are in the role of an authority. So as participants, you see the chairs in the front of the room telling everybody when to speak and what to do and what not to do. Uh, so as a chair, you do have authority. Um, people listen to you, you are the face of the simulation. That also comes with responsibility. 
Um, and uh, on the slide, you see some good uh, practices or also some, some very necessary <laughs> practices and attributes to sharing, um, which is, of course, fairness and equality. You should treat all uh, participants the same, uh, fairly, equally, doesn't matter which party they represent or which country they represent or which country they're from or what they look like. Um, but everybody has uh, the same right to speak and the same uh, right to be treated equally. Um, good spirit, no antagonism between chairs and participants. This is also really important as a chair, you don't want participants to hate you uh, because then they don't want to listen to you anymore. <laughs> um, so it is, while it is a role of authority, it's also important to keep the connection, um, to remain approachable, to not uh, be the enemy of participants, um, but help just facilitate the discussion. That, that's really what it's about. It's not about cutting people off or, or kicking people out. It's, <laughs> it's about really uh, making possible that the, the debate is able to be had. Want to be respected, respect others. This is, I think, very self-explanatory. It applies to almost everything in life. And want people to follow you, lead by the way you're displaying uh, an impeccable knowledge of the rules of procedure. This is essential. Um, Yogam already mentioned it. The rules of procedure are quite complex, but as a chair, you are the ultimate authority on applying and interpreting them. So you should really know what they are. And in the end, even if you are not 100% sure, uh, you decide how things are done. <laughs> uh, and this is the authority that um, the chairs have and that they also should, should be aware of. Yeah, the authority of a chair disappears the moment it is invoked. Um, that means that as soon as participants start to, to question the authority of the chair. Basically, the whole simulation is uh, a little bit in, in the, the success of the debate is a little bit uh, in danger, let's, let's say it like that. So it's really important as a chair to always uh, make sure to follow these rules that we just outlined and uh, that we're going to get into more in the discussion. Okay, the next slide will be again represented by Marco. Yeah, uh, these are three fundamental pieces of advice that uh, I wish I had known when I started uh, chairing. Um, let's start with the first one. So make participants stick to the timetable, which we have already said uh, it's uh, fundamental for, the su for a successful simulation while uh, giving them also the impression they are having fun. Uh, this is uh, important, of course, because participants have to understand, of course, that they are uh, working uh, um, in a, they are doing a simulation uh, and they have to enjoy the, their, their, this, 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 this simulation. Uh, they have to understand what they are doing. They have to understand European politics. They have to understand their roles. Uh, the timetable itself, it's something that must be managed by the chair. And it's not always as easy as it looks like because there may be uh, a lot of issues while uh, the, the, the chambers are working. So it is important that the chair doesn't add, that doesn't add this, uh, this stressful uh, thing to the participants. The chair have to, uh, to manage that while also letting participants uh, enjoying the simulation. The second, uh, the second piece of advice is uh, as fundamental as the first one. Um, you have to understand since the very first day, uh, not of the simulation, but that you know you are chairing with somebody, you have to understand how you are going to chair with him or with her. You have to, uh, you have to be aware of how he or she is and how they are going to, to chair your, your, their part of the simulation. And therefore you have also to change or uh, at least modify a bit how you're going to chair your part. Uh, I'd say that uh, uh, chairing with somebody is a, a work that at least from my point of view is a bit like of a bad cops, uh, good cops. So you have to be, you have to find uh, between your, your chair pair, the, the guy or the girl, the, the chair that knows how to be a bit more, um, let's say, um, I wouldn't say aggressive, but it makes uh, it makes clear that uh, people stick to the rules. And uh, at the same time, you have to find also another chair that can be a uh, little less, uh, less bad, so more um, peaceful and that can try also to, to mediate between the chair and the other participants 
should a problem arise. Um, eventually, uh, a fundamental um, suggestion that I always make when uh, somebody asks me how to chair properly is put yourself in participant shoes. If you have never participated to ever any uh, MEU before, it's going to be very difficult for you to understand how to chair. And if you want to be a good chair, you have to, 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 to put yourself in participant shoes and you have to understand how they are going to feel if, for example, they, um, they, they don't understand at the beginning a rule of procedure. You have to understand that this is not as easy as it sounds to somebody like me, Christine or Yogam, that we have done thousands of uh, simulations. So above all for people that just started the, 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 the simulation world, the model European Union world, you have to, to, to realize that this is not as easy as it, uh, it may look like. So uh, always uh, try to ask yourself, uh, what would I, how would I feel? What would I think if I were the, the participant right now? Uh, moving to the next, uh, to the next slide, uh, uh, three small things that uh, uh, may sound uh, obvious, but eventually they are not. Uh, uh, the first thing is that chairs uh, are seen uh, by participants like the interface between uh, the simulation side and the, the logistical dimension. So they have to, uh, to manage this, this connection in a way that can be as smooth as possible. Because trust me, if there is some problem between the logistical dimension and the, and the simulation part, uh, this is not going to be only seen, but this is going to be also really noted by participants. And this can be uh, uh, very problematic for the simulation itself. You don't want to add uh, a logistical problem to, uh, to the debate. You don't want the, the debate to be kind of uh, uh, ruined by logistical issues. So, try to keep the logistical issues as um, out of the discussion as, as possible. Um, another thing, you may be wrong while you chair. Uh, I, I have been wrong so many times while discussing the rules of procedure. Uh, I may have forgotten a rule of procedure myself, even if I am the chair and I am supposed to, 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 to know them. And I, I knew them, but uh, of course it's normal that while you talk in front of uh, many people, or sometimes even 50, 60 people, you can, um, you can go, go wrong. You can maybe sometimes uh, not be sure, as sure as you should be. Even if you are wrong, just act as you were right and then apologize later to, to the participants. Uh, the point is, if you say that you are wrong, right uh, after your mistake your authority may be uh may be kind of may kind of decrease uh due to that of course if the participants understand that that you are wrong and they point out that in that case you have to absolutely apologize and say yes that in that time i was wrong and i'm sorry there are two these are two different occasions and if you apologize and you make clear that uh, you you made a mistake but that you that you apologized for that uh, i mean it never happened to me that participants were angry at me but they understood that we are people just like them and that uh, yes we do know the rules of procedure better than other but we don't know them um as 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 good as we uh, as we can no, uh, I don't know, uh, any other, other thing. It's a very difficult process. And above all, at the beginning, uh, rules of procedure can be uh, very tough to, to understand. And also another problem that may arise is that uh, uh, rules of procedure can be smoothly different between a model European Union and another. So you could get confused. Uh, this is another thing that you have to take care of. And uh, eventually, yes, um, even chairing can be fun and even chairing can be a very, um, very funny in the way you, 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 you want to do that. Uh, and again, it's a way of uh, managing the, 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 the chairing part with your partner. 
and if you, if you want to have fun you should definitely you should definitely be the good cop and uh, uh, being the good cop is always uh, better when sharing but again learning is uh, is uh, is an important part also for the chair i mean you you understand how um, uh, uh, a discussion works and how to moderate one and also how to improve yourself while you moderate uh, simulation. Um, I guess that's the last uh, word for me about uh, never about things not to forget. We could move to the discussion about what makes a good chair and more. Um, I don't know. I I don't know. How we want to do that. Maybe um, Christine. I we discussed uh, some some days ago about being a good cop and a bad cop. And I think it's a very important part. And I remember we discussed that together in Brussels. Maybe you want to say something about that. Sorry, I didn't uh, put the microphone. So I would definitely love to discuss about that. I just want to give a quick shout out because we have some new people who joined us uh, in the Zoom call. Uh, so it would be great if you could just leave a comment with your name and maybe your role at MU Strasbourg or any thoughts uh, or questions you have. Uh, feel free to also use the chat while we talk. Uh, as Marco uh, already announced, like we will uh, now discuss a little bit our experience chairs. Um, but if you hear anything that doesn't make sense to you or maybe you haven't attended a simulation yet and you don't really understand what we're talking about, uh, let us know, write us in the chat, uh, and we'll be happy to address that uh, because we do want to make sure that this webinar is as useful as possible as it can be for you, although it's fun for us as well to talk about this. <laughs> uh, but back to your question, Marco, uh, the good cop, bad cop. I think it's uh, it's important for every chairing couple to, to discuss this, so I'm glad we had that uh, conversation back in Brussels uh, because it, I think it should be avoided to have, um, although there, it's, it's, it's nice if there's like a good cop and a bad cop in a sharing team, but at the same time, it shouldn't be too different. Like the, the rules of procedure should be applied uniformly. Participants, uh, I think, need to know what they can expect. And uh, I've seen some, uh, some chairs that haven't uh, sufficiently, I think, coordinated uh, their style beforehand. So it was quite a radical difference of, of who was sharing at a given time. Uh, so I think that definitely is a uh, is a conversation to be had, uh, and it's it's a little bit like parents you should have <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit different approach. Uh, everybody has a different personality, so cheering should be also uh, yeah sh showing the good sides of your personality uh, while still maintaining like a coherent approach um, because that's that's very important. Yeah. Uh... I absolutely agree with you and uh, also may I may add that uh, no matter if you are the good or the bad cop and I think Christine you you agree with me you yeah. also have to again understand that participants may be wrong and that you cannot be too strict with the rules of procedure you have to understand that they can be wrong and uh, you cannot be uh, you cannot attack them just because they don't know the rules of procedure or that or because they make mistakes. So you have to be uh, like a parent, exactly. Like I, I couldn't find a better word for, for that. So that's a very precise, uh, a very precise uh, um, way to explain how the chairing couple should, uh, should work. Um, maybe uh, Yogam, what do you think about this bad cop, good cop? Yeah, so I agree, but I think also a lot of it actually comes with our experience. I think it's very important to have done quite a bit of MEUs because I think you know from your experience on what it means to be a participant. And I think that's going to be very crucial to how we become chairs also. I think the empathy factor is very important. So we also know that some things we have to be a little bit more strict on. Some things, if they run over the time for a bit, I think that's okay. And of course, I think that really comes from experience. So I would definitely encourage for people, if they intend to be a chair at some point in time, go to as many MEUs as possible, take on many roles and learn. And of course, the chairs that you have as a participant also affects your eventual pairing style. 
So I think ultimately, if we want to be a good cop or bad cop, it's really based on what we saw and what we internalized. So that is something that I would say. But of course, yeah, parents, like in parenting, I think it's never a case of two good sides and two bad sides. You have to step in. Even if the so-called bad cop chair is being nice, I think then you kind of have to switch and basically have each other's back. Chairing is really, I think... It's a very good example of teamwork and it really shows when you have very good teamwork. So, yeah. Yeah, experience is fundamental as well. I mean, maybe it's the role for which you need to be more experienced, even more than commissioner maybe or any other important role in, uh, in a simulation. Is there anything else you want to, 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 to put up in this, uh, in this debate? Uh, there is a question from uh, Alberi. I guess maybe we can move to the question time. Well, I if... think we can uh, we can answer the question and just continue discussing. Okay. Because I have I definitely have some some things uh, that okay. came up for me. Okay. Uh, so I'll be uh, just. I'm sorry if the pronunciation is not the right one. Is that the correct one? I'll be No, you are pronouncing better than Albanians. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, another thing you're going Great. to struggle a lot with uh, is pronunciation of names. Uh, there are like, uh, although I speak German or at least I try, there are yes. some German names that just make me crazy. Uh, so <laughs> pronunciation is, a, is a, another very hard thing to, to manage. Uh, but Alberi just asked us, uh, do you use any application for measuring the timetable and also the talking time? Or do you the deputies, for example? Uh, this is a very good question. Um, we mentioned the fact that secretaries are uh, important uh, and secretaries uh, in the bigger uh, simulations, uh, they manage the timetable and uh, the talking time. Um, we do have an application. I don't remember the exact name. I think it's uh, called the Xmune. And uh, it's, uh, it's an application that you can download easily from, from your computer. And uh, it gives you um, um, a list of countries that you can give the war to. And it's very easy to, to use. And um, I think we could also share the link of the application with, uh, with the participants of this call when the call is, uh, is over. Uh, it gives also you a good overview of how the, um, the talking time uh, works. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Um, I think uh, I have something to add. As in, um, I don't think there's a correct answer for this question. I, I've seen a lot of different systems being used and all of them have worked out fine. Uh, it's just important to decide on it in advance because it's ne it never looks good if you arrive at your chair <laughs> in the front of the participants and then you just... Uh, think about, oh, well, but how I'm going to keep the time. So it's definitely something to um, to consider in advance. But I've seen also uh, cherry teams working, especially in the parliament, um, because the, the uh, MUN software is not as easy to set up for the, the parliament. Um, so I've seen um, just a, like a word document for the speakers list and uh, on the other side of the screen uh, that is being projected in the front, like a, the, the countdown timer. Uh, from the computer, for example, which is uh, a very easy but also uh, efficient way to do it. <laughs> Yogan, do you have any, any favorite practices? <laughs> for me, I would say that usually I chair in parliament and it's really big. So like, I think the MUN software is a little bit difficult to toggle, but I also hear that there are some MUs that are working on trying to hack this and try to have uh, all the parliament names and everything inside. So I think it really helps if you have a secretary, but some MUs, you don't have a secretary, so the chairs have to do everything. And it's something that you also have to discuss beforehand. And sometimes I've been to MUs where the internet just fails. So every, you, everything, you, you can't actually have an online time or anything, so you have to improvise, you have to use your phone, you do whatever you can basically to just get things running. So of course, we have a few backups in mind, but I would think that sharing really tests your multitasking ability and also your ability to adapt. So I think we definitely have a few things 
in our head, of course, and there is no one preferred application. I think people who have been to MUNs, they're more familiar with this, but for MUs, I think it's a little bit more flexible, of course. I think what you just mentioned is really important, and I had that in mind already before when Marco was speaking, that as a chair, it's, it's a little bit challenging in that you, you can prepare and you should prepare, but in the end, things always happen anyways, and you need to adapt and improvise. Uh, like with the internet failing, for example, or um, something like that. And it's a, it's a skill that is, uh, of course, acquired through chairing, but, and, and that can be used at further in use, but that's also very, uh, very useful for life in general. Uh, I have to say that since I started chairing, I think I've become much more uh, assertive and uh, confident in speaking in front of people in general. Uh, in, in university uh, setting, for example, when I need to make presentation because I'm a little bit more used to being in front of people in the room and uh, also just to be confident about what I'm saying, even if I'm not 100% sure about it all the time. Uh, but it's, it is important to stand your ground. And then, uh, as we discussed before, as Marco said, um, if, if there is a mistake, also to own up for it. That's, that's a really, really important thing to do do as a chair, which can be applied in like every other different areas of life, I think. I have a question if we could talk about yeah. this. So maybe uh, Margaret and Christine, in one word, what is chairing to you? If you could use one word to convince people or to even what it means to you, what would be a word that you would use to describe chairing? I don't think I have a word that can convince people to chair. Uh, uh, surely I have a word uh, to describe how chairing it is. And uh, I'd say it is definitely the word uh, uh, managing and with all, with everything that it, uh, it means. Because it means literally managing the whole uh, simulation from a certain point of view. Because of course you have to discuss, you have to manage, sorry, the, the discussion itself, but you, as I said, you have also to take care of the logistical part, at least from the participants' point of view. So managing, I, I'd go with uh, with this word. I actually, uh, <laughs> even though that's very un uncreative right now, I think I would absolutely need to agree with Marco. I've tried to think of another word in the meantime, but I think managing captures it the best and multitasking. <laughs> Because you, you do need to track uh, a lot of things at once, you know, the, the timetable, the speaking time, the speakers list, uh, the motions and points which appear here and there. Sometimes you get a message uh, from the organizing team saying that coffee break is moved up or moved later or something and you need to kind of adapt um, the, the debate to that. So it's, it's a lot of overall management uh, and, and multitasking in the way that... Uh, yeah, there's just a lot of things happening at the same time. And it's quite a challenging experience and it's also very exhausting, I yeah. think, <laughs> uh, to be a chair and to have like to have, be constantly on the lookout for all of these things. Uh, but it's also incredibly enriching and empowering, I think, to, to realize that you can do it because I think everybody can be a chair. Uh, it's, it's a matter of, of skill and practice rather than <clears throat> talent or something like that, in my opinion. Yogam, what's your word? How, what would you say? I would say guidance, because if I think about it, that's what we do for a solid sometimes eight hours a day, right? Guiding participants mm. to speak. We are looking at the people who don't speak more, and we have to go to them during coffee breaks and encourage them to speak more. So I would say guidance, definitely. You're guiding the, the session, participants and everything. So... It might look actually very easy, but it's very mentally tiring also. I would say that yeah. at, at, by the time we are done with the session, we are really sloshed. <laughs> and participants, sometimes they might think that, okay, you know, we're just telling them to speak and we're telling them, okay, don't speak. But we also have to listen if it's a valid argument. And so we, and then we also have to, like what you mentioned, management and multitasking, it's, it's everything. I would say chairing is a melting pot. So... Yeah, guidance would be my word, yeah. Yeah. Um, have mm -hmm. you ever forced, uh, Yogam, Christine, have you ever kind of forced somebody to, to speak 
during a session. So have you ever asked a <laughs> member of the European Parliament, Mr. Rossi, uh, I would like to hear your opinion. Have you ever done that? Yeah, and that's actually kind of uh, my style. Maybe I'm a little bit of the bad cop. I would make a mental note, if not sometimes, if it's too big, I would write down who is not speaking. It's a bit intimidating, but I would also just pick up participants and be like, from certain factions if they're not speaking and force them to speak. But I would say at the end of the day, it has had quite good benefits because I've seen participants grow from not speaking. And then eventually by the end of the simulation, they've said something, they're very happy about it. And sometimes they come to me during coffee break or lunch and say that, I'm so glad that you did that because I would have never necessarily had the, um, the guts to actually do it myself. So thank you for helping me. And I think it's even more rewarding when you see them at another MEU and because of you throwing them into the cold water. So sometimes it's, it really helps. It's not necessarily a thing that people like. Sometimes you get hate from participants from doing this because they don't really want to speak. But on in my experience, I would say that it's been to the greater benefit. Yeah. I think it's also the way you, you ask that. I mean, you, you don't actually force that, but you kindly ask somebody to give uh, their opinion to us. And I think it's very important. That, and as you said, Yogam, uh, talking in front of uh, a lot of people can be very challenging. But once you do that for the first time, maybe going completely wrong with your English, maybe just inventing English word as I did uh, during my first simulation. I mean, uh, that's something that once you do once, then you do twice, uh, you, you, you got to know how, you, how it goes and uh, this helps you a lot. Christine, have you ever done that? I, I think you are more of the good cop here, so I, I don't know. Uh, I think I, you can call me a good cop in that I want the learning experience of the participants to always come first. So even though the rules of procedure are important and I want to, and I, as a chair, my, my job is to apply them. Um, I think in the end, uh, it's more important that the participants have a good experience, that they learn what they're supposed to and not that we're like very strict to the second of like, no, now you're finished speaking, uh, something like that. So I'm definitely the, the good cop in this way. Uh, and it also comes with what Yoga mentioned kind of, pushing people a little bit sometimes if you see that they're insecure or they usually they have something on their mind which they don't they don't uh, maybe have the they're not sure if it's like correct or something like that um, so I think another way is to approach them during the coffee breaks for example or, or during the morning uh, and just give them reassurance that their their voice is valid that their point matters that it's a, it's a good point to make um and and usually they they think about it a little bit and then they do speak uh from from own initiative um other than that i think also uh putting people a little bit on the spot is appropriate sometimes uh, also just not to have the debate dominated by the same people all the time because that tends to happen as well uh that like five people keep speaking again and again and it does uh, start to be a divide between these five people with no one else really involved uh, just to avoid that, I think it's also important to make sure to, to monitor the room a little bit and um, yeah, give people the chance or actively uh, invite them to take the floor if they want to. But I don't think I've ever forced anyone <laughs> and I don't think that's possible um, to stand up and, and speak if they don't want to. And uh, speaking of participants, what do you uh, guys think about learning a participant's name? Uh, instead of talk, instead of uh, calling them, I don't know, Minister of Lithuania or MEP Germany EPP, uh, do you do that? And uh, actually, are you like, are you able to to learn names? Because uh, sometimes I am very bad at that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and it happens that I meet people again after a year or something at another conference, and I just remember that they were the Minister of Belgium, but I don't remember their name or anything else uh, so it's definitely a challenge because you see uh, you see a lot of people um, and you call on a lot of people and many of them have uh, in an international environment obviously names that you are not used to or that you don't know how to pronounce that you have no connection to 
so it's it's definitely challenging but i think it's good to try and i always try to ask the organizers for a participant list in advance so that i can have a look at it and maybe ask some friends how they are pronounced or um yeah maybe where where this name is from so what, what kind of background these participants have i think it's very it, it's nice to try and it's always appreciated by the participants as well for myself i would usually go with the faction and the country of course um, and my co-chair who's not here frank and he likes to actually call uh, participants surname so I think it's 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 good to have a little bit of a mix also definitely. So you have two different sharing styles and sometimes it's quite interesting because um, maybe by the third day we still don't get the surname right because some surnames are very difficult but participants have been really nice to actually uh, let us try and things like that and I think it's quite interesting that sometimes when we chair and it really shows because the next time you see them you don't necessarily remember their first name all you remember is their surname uh, or whatever position that they were having in the MU. So that's that's quite interesting. Maybe that's a little bit of a flaw of chain because you're so busy and that's all you remember. So yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to learn all the names, but I, I try to write a list of that maybe the people that talk the most and uh, uh, also people that don't talk a lot so that I can involve them more in the discussion. Alberi just uh, told us that she has to leave. We say hi, thank you for joining us, and thank see you, you <laughs> maybe in Strasbourg. Let's Hopefully. let's let's hope so. Um, Christine, you said that you had something that you wanted to discuss with us. Um, do you remember what what that was? Uh, yeah, I think I, I touched upon it when I said that chairing has brought me a lot of things um, that are mm. not only useful in chairing, but also in, in very other different areas of life. Uh, and I would be interested also to hear from you what were the maybe the, the biggest challenges for you in chairing, but how has overcoming these challenges also helped you in other areas? Not necessarily um, you related. Uh, personally, I... I, I agree with you when you say that you 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 improve also, for example, your presentation skills, because uh, it's absolutely true that you 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 get better at talking in front of uh, other people, which is something that it's not as easy as it may as it may seem. Uh, it's uh, actually really challenging, and uh, during the first uh, uh, MEU that I chaired, the one in uh, the one in Trento, I was terrified. Uh, I was a, a commissioner, but also kind of chair. And uh, I remember that uh, I, I at a certain point, I just stopped talking for three seconds because I had to breathe and think about what I was going to say. And it was very embarrassing, but uh, um, it never happened to me um, anymore. Uh, and uh, it, 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 so it helped me a lot. Also, for example, managing new situations or something that is really uh, kind of a surprise during uh, during the simulation itself. I don't know. Yeah, as you said, the, the coffee break is is gonna be postponed or it's gonna be deleted because we don't have enough time. And even if you delete the the the, the, the coffee break, maybe you don't have uh, enough time, so the timeline is running out. So how do you manage that? That's something that it's very difficult. And I'm very happy that I can write down on my curriculum vitae that I am able to manage these these things. This is this is something that you can use for any a kind of uh, almost any work related to the political side, but also anything related to the human uh, uh, human part. Let's uh, let's say. So I am. I, I I think that chairing gave me more than participating from the point of view of the skills. Maybe I learned more about the European Union by participating, but chairing is all about the skills that, that, you, that you have already and that you can develop while you chair. Yogam, what do you think? I would say for me, I learned to be a little bit more sure of myself in terms of decision-making because the thing with being a participant in an MEU, okay, you come there, you have a role to play, but for chairing, you have to make a lot of decisions also. And if you are not sure of your decision, the participants are not going to buy it. And you also have to make decisions that kind of are sound in the sense that you can't necessarily just make up things as you go. Of course, you can do it to a certain extent, but 
you can't last the entire session with it. So I would say that it, I that's something that I have learned through chairing to be a little bit more sure of my decisions and to have it impact in my actual life. So that it's a direct soft skill, perhaps. It's on a personal development level, I would say, yeah. Yeah, um, and I'd say like maybe something uh, which is less related to skills and more related to being able to use uh, technology is the role of the secretary that we have already talked about. Um, and I would like to stress once more the importance of having a good, uh, a good secretary. Also because as Yogam said uh, many times while you chair, you don't have secretaries. And this can be really difficult to, to manage. Uh, having a, the good secretaries is a key part of, uh, of, the, of the simulation. And uh, in uh, MU Strasbourg, you have an internal secretary and an external one. And uh, they have always uh, done a great work. Uh, without them, I, I think the chair would go crazy because, uh, of course, MU Strasbourg is a very big simulation, above all when it comes to the parliament, which is is uh, usually 100 people more or less uh, so it's you have to have uh, a good relationship for example with your secretary i think you have to understand them you have also to tell them how you want them to communicate with you because uh, for example while i talk in front of people i don't want anybody to interrupt me unless it's an emergency so i prefer if you i don't know write a note or something or you write a message to me in uh, any social that we use during the simulation. Um, and this is something that you have to tell uh, the, 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 the secretaries before, of course, because you, you cannot do that uh, while you are working. So yeah, cooperation between chair is fundamental, but maybe also secretaries are a, a fundamental part of the process. And I've never had a bad experience with, uh, with any secretary um, I mean, I, I did once, actually, one of the secretaries, while I was participating, uh, he forgot to upload the, the, the um, amendment sheet. And uh, he thought that he did it. So he never uh, kind of mentioned it to us. Uh, oh, guys, by the way, I forgot to upload that. And so we couldn't find for, uh, I think, one day the, the simulation, the, the, the amendment uh, paper. And we went crazy and uh, the, the, the amendments uh, that we wrote were so bad because we, we had to rush in the process. Of course, I'm not gonna say in which, in which uh, simulation it was, but uh, I mean, it, again, I, I just want to stress out, yes, secretaries are a fundamental part of the practical side of, uh, of the simulation. Uh, have you ever had any bad experience with the secretaries? I would I say don't... for myself, no, ah. actually. Oh, I'll just quickly wrap up. So yeah, can... yeah. No. For myself, actually, no. I would say the maybe a lot of times when we actually have secretaries, they are usually very new. So we also have to spend some time teaching them and so that they also get what exactly we want out of them. So I think that would be maybe an additional job of being a chair also so that you have to tell them to have the timer starting, for example, when we want it, because maybe in our head, it's like, okay, you know, it's an obvious thing, but it might not necessarily be obvious to someone who's not chairing. I would say maybe a secretary is kind of like a passive chair who's not actively speaking, but they have to also be listening and being very aware of everything that's going on. So, yeah. I think that connects very well with one of the questions we received on YouTube. Um, Tamara has asked, how do you coordinate with your chairing partner and the rest of the team? Do you ever struggle with coordination and cooperation? And um, I think communication is really the key, both with the with the secretary and the co-chairs. Like you need to talk about how you work best, how you uh, want to work together. Because as, as Yoga mentioned, what can be obvious for the one person doesn't need to be obvious for the other person, especially if you're working in a European setting where people come from different countries with different habits different cultural ideas of like what is appropriate in, in communication. So that is for sure something uh, that I don't think I've ever really struggled with or I've never really failed with, but I've definitely struggled with that. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, that also 
uh, maybe disagreeing with your chairing partner. I've once chaired with a with another chair that I felt like she was being too strict. It was a little bit too damaging to the debates, uh, in my opinion, because I, I value the learning experience more, as I mentioned before. And that was a challenging conversation to have because I basically needed to tell her that I disagree with how she's doing it, um, which is never a really nice thing to say. And it's not something that you just bring up um, you know, during the debate. So having this kind of conversation, giving honest feedback is very essential to chairing and uh, another skill that, that you can use also in other areas of life. And we've had another question as well, which we also touched upon a little bit um, before. Julius has asked, um, what was the best and what was the worst moments you had as a chair? Do you have any like top, top moments that you still think about sometimes, either good or bad? <laughs> I do have one. Uh, Yogam, do you mind if I talk first? Uh, I'd say uh, the worst uh, and maybe also the, the best one was uh, um, in Milan uh, because two participants started arguing from a, uh, like they started in a political, uh, in the political kind of side, but then they switched to a personal uh, offensive uh, way of uh, debating. And of course, we had to stop that. Uh, we had to stop this this discussion, but at the same time we couldn't stop the the discussion uh, uh, between between the other MEPs. So um, what uh, what we did, what me and Tamara uh, did, uh, she was the president there. Um, we decided that while she uh, was going to keep chairing, I, I I I took them with me. I took these two participants uh, arguing to each other with me. And I tried to, 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 to kind of make some peace, uh, like a peace enforcer uh, outside of the room. It was uh, kind of difficult because these two guys uh, really were on the opposite side on anything, uh, like from politics to uh, personal views. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say that they became best friends. That didn't happen, but at least they stopped uh, their their arguments uh, and it was a very um, I, I I'd say very challenging moment but when it worked and because it, it worked uh, like they they came back to their room and they never had the argument uh, again uh, it was a very a personal victory that I really I was very happy um, about for me I would say the best would definitely be I believe it was MEU Vienna 2019 when I was chairing. And it's very uh, interesting because when it's MEU with a lot of new participants and you get to see them grow over the days and that's very rewarding for me to see them trust themselves and speak. And I think that to me is the best thing I get out of chairing to see themselves trust in what they're saying and to uh, get the whole idea of what exactly the simulation and why MEU is such an addiction. I would say, because I would say for the fact that we ourselves have been to countless MEUs, it's definitely a good form of addiction. And it's it's very nice when someone else actually sees that also. And for like the bad part, I would say sometimes, you know, when you have really good friends as participants, all the more it's a bit more difficult for you to tell them to please stop, stop pushing it sometimes. But you really have to grit your teeth and be like, Sometimes you have to text them or pull them to the side and be like, please, can you can you please calm down a little bit? Because I know that they're pushing us a little bit more because they are very good friends. But I would say that is maybe a little bit of a downside of chairing because it's your very good friend, but also you need to be a good chair and you have to make sure that you are fair to everybody. I would say that's the worst experience when sometimes they're really pushing it and you're just torn on what exactly you should be doing. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, before I give uh, my my opinion or my, my thoughts on this topic, uh, I would encourage you both uh, who are watching us uh, with us in the Zoom meeting to submit questions into the chat, as well as those who are uh, watching us on YouTube. We are following um, the comment section. So if you have any more questions before we wrap this up um, soon, then uh, feel free to ask. We're happy to. Um, yeah, touch, touch on those points about everything you've ever wanted to know about sharing. And I think for me, the worst experience, and 
it wasn't the worst in 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 hindsight it was one of the best learning experiences for me but i definitely perceived it as a very stressful experience at the time it was in mu lisbon uh, 2019 last year and we had a council that the council uh, that was supposed to vote. It was on the final day of the simulation and somehow something happened and they all just went on a strike and no one wanted to do anything and they all like banded together to vote against the proposal for, in my opinion, very uh, stupid reasons. It was a whole like side story developing of Romania invading like France or something like it, it started off as a very as a, like a joke during the press conferences and it grew into this whole thing that had nothing to do anymore with the simulation. And that was a hard moment for me because I needed to kind of stop the fun and say, you know, let's get back to what actually matters here, which is in the end um, the proposal. And I knew it would be very kind of, uh, yeah, a blow to the whole experience if like the proposal was completely disapproved. Uh, even if it's just a simulation, it is nice to have a victory in the end. So I had a quite tough talk with them, with the, with these council members that uh, went on a strike to really uh, please focus on consider, reconsider their actions and uh, that they can achieve more by actually uh, productively participating in the debate instead of uh, yeah boycotting it for some fun reasons. It's fun for five minutes, but at some point um, it was getting a little bit yeah, everybody else was starting to be a little bit annoyed with them as well. So in the end, um, this kind of pep talk that I gave them <laughs> was, I think, one of the one of the moments where I really realized most my authority as a chair, and um, and I was yeah quite proud of how I handled that, even though I was really really nervous at the time because I don't like to be the bad cop. I don't like to, you know, stop people from having fun or or kind of punish them for for not following the rules. That's uh, I, I don't personally enjoy that, but <laughs> I think it was necessary for the for the simulation at that point. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's important that the chair also guides uh, the discussion itself. Like if you are, I don't know, if you're talking about uh, some defense related topic, you cannot start uh, some discussion about uh, climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to stick to the topic. And that's uh, very important. Never happened to me that uh, something uh, um, kind of changed the discussion uh, bigly, like uh, to you, Christine, that was a very difficult situation to handle. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's important that chairs also know uh, what we are discussing about. Like the, the chair knows both of the proposals because we are going to be kind of uh, inside the debate as well, even if only for guidance. Um, we have a question from uh, Gaia. Uh, she asks us how to handle uh, like she asked uh, about tips on how to handle difficult situations uh, like um, not cooperating participants or uh, arguing participants and uh, would you would you discuss on that would you would you say something about that I think it's a uh... That's for me one of the most challenging things about cheering. Uh, I think rooted in my personality, I like harmony. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I, I personally don't stand tension very well. Uh, but it really depends. Like you sort of need to read the participants. With some, it works better to just ignore them. Some, um, yeah. Sometimes there is like this this little games going on with, as I said, the, the Romania invading the rest of the EU. Um, which was fun for a moment, but then it just became a little bit too too crazy. Uh, and in this uh, situation, sometimes it can be more useful to just ignore it, to just not give it any more attention, to just not uh, let the let the situation escalate even more, uh, and just to consistently keep bringing people back to the topic. And sometimes it works best, as also Marco said, to to just take those people outside and and have a talk with them in private and really show that this is not. Uh, helping anyone <laughs> uh, and this is not the, the point of the simulation so it's really uh, it, it's a really tricky question because there's no generalized answer you it really depends on how you handle things best and how the participants respond best um, and I definitely uh, think that there will be um, that these situations will appear and sometimes you're not going to be happy with how you handle things in the like in retrospect but this is part of the learning experience so there's no one will do it always right 
from the very beginning. Like it's always about trying different things, see what worked, what didn't, and then try to do it better next time. And this is also maybe what makes it so addicting to be a chair or to go to Emmys in general, because you can always, um, yeah, learn something new, apply something new and, and realize how, how you've been growing. Do you have any thoughts on that yoga? Yeah, for me, I would say, I think um, my preferred method, of course, is to just pull them out and speak to them. And sometimes you find out that it's not necessarily that, you know, um, it's some conflict or something. Maybe they think it's purely fun, but sometimes they don't really know when it goes from fun to being disruptive. And if you speak to them on a personal level, like, hey, I've been there, I've done that. And they kind of get it. And I think that's when they also trust that as a chair, you have been there and they trust your experience and they are willing to actually comply. So when they come back in, they understand that what they are doing has already gone past the limits of being fun. But I would think instead of publicly maybe shaming them, I think it's always better to pull them to the side. Because I've seen some chairs, of course, you discipline them in front of everybody and it might not necessarily go down so well. And sometimes if they're being very disruptive during the session, it has happened that either myself or my co-chair, during the session, we have to get them out. And so it's one person sharing while you speak with the other person outside. But it really depends. And I would say that there really is no right way or one way. And that's something that really challenges us at chairs also to see what exactly we can do to make sure that it's the best solution for everybody and to make sure that nobody necessarily is hurt at the end of the day because you want them to still enjoy the simulation for the rest of the days and to also come back to MEUs in many other forms. Maybe one day these participants could also be your chair if you are back as a participant. So it's really important to shape their experience, I would say. Um, one last thing that I'd say um, is you have to act. Uh, you have to be uh, fast. And you, it, it has to be clear that you're not losing touch. Um, so um, be active and uh, act as soon as this thing happened. Don't uh, wait for something else to wait you because you have to be the person that in this case has to manage this, this situation. So again, act fast and uh, yes, think before you act, but try to do it as fast as possible because uh, uh, any second uh, can really put you in a, a very difficult uh, situation. Um, I don't think we have other questions as, as much as I know. Um, I don't see any question in the chat. And uh, I don't know, do we have any other question on YouTube? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so, but I, I might have a question for the three of us to discuss very quickly if it's possible. Um, what would you say um, as a piece of advice for participants who are looking to transit to being a chair and maybe if they want to chair at MU Strasbourg in the coming years, what would you tell them? Um, Christine, I, I, I'd say just very, a very fast thing and then I, I'd give you the word. Uh, um, apply for as many MUs as possible. MU Strasbourg in particular, but any MU needs a good chair and a good chair is made by participation. And good participation uh, is, uh, is the key of, uh, of chairing and can be achieved only if you, uh, if you participate in many MUs. And uh, try not only to apply once as, a, as MEP and once as, a, as minister, but try to see uh, as many points of view as as you can. So um, of course you don't decide where to go, but you could always try to ask or write something in your application that makes clear that you would like to be kind of the far right part. Because uh, um, I think it also helps you out understanding their points of view, which are not my points of view uh, at all. Uh, but still, there is some, some I, I'd say that there is some logic in that if so many people vote for them. So this is a good way to understand at least the reasons why uh, these politicians are voted. Again, uh, I'm not saying it's uh, wrong, it's, uh, it's good. I'm saying uh, try to understand these points of view. So participate is the key uh, for good chairing, the first, uh, the first thing for good chairing. 
I think, uh, yeah, similarly to Marco, the more you participate and the more different chairs you see as a participant, the more approaches, you know, uh, the more you are aware that there's no right way to do it. And maybe uh, I've, I've seen several chairs during my career as a participant who I really, uh, really, really learned a lot from. Uh, and that really inspired me also to, to take certain actions or to take a certain approach. So that definitely matters a lot. And um, at, at the same time, I would say, don't hesitate for too long. No one is the perfect chair <laughs> from the very beginning. You know, you can do 100 conferences at a participant, but it's, at some point it's going to be the first time that uh, you chair, if, if that's something you choose to, which I would absolutely recommend. <laughs> um, so uh, don't, don't be afraid uh, to ask her. Usually uh, we put, um, you know, one more experienced chair and one less experienced chair together uh, so that they, they can learn and uh, learn from each other. And don't, in this situation, if you are the less experienced chair, don't hesitate to ask questions, but also don't hesitate to say that you don't agree with something. I think a good way to start, if you are a little bit unsure if you can handle, let's say, the, the attention uh, of being at the front of the room for eight hours a day is to uh, try as a secretary. Um, because you are kind of more passive, you're not really actively uh, speaking or deciding things, but you are a really, really important part of the simulation and that you're uh, assisting the chairs, that you're in the front of the room and uh, organizing <laughs> the, the timetable and the speakers list and such things. So that's a really good experience as well. And yeah, and, and in the end, uh, you're just going to have to <laughs> throw yourself into the cold water. I think we all went through it the first time. It's always, uh, I was, I was really quite nervous and anxious and didn't and, and insecure about uh, everything. I didn't feel like I know the rules of procedure my, uh, well enough. I didn't feel like I was authoritative enough. Uh, all of these things, but it just comes with practice, um, and that's the thing I would recommend to you. Don't have too high expectations for yourself, but also don't hesitate to to use that as an experience to learn. Um, and to do it better next time and to learn more about yourself and, and sharing and working with people. Yes, yeah, so I'll just quickly add on for this. Of course, participation is very important. And the more you know about how MU is and rules of procedure, it's going to help you as a chair. But of course, I think like all of our first time, it's going to be full of mistakes sometimes. A lot of like, you're not very sure of yourself. It's okay to make mistakes. And I think one good thing about the MEU simulation sphere itself is that there's always someone there to actually guide you. So like what Christine mentioned, you're always usually paired with a more experienced chair. And even for MEU Strasbourg, you have your chairs coordinator and you have your other chairs. So you can definitely rely on them to expand your own knowledge. And if you're looking to make that transition from being a participant to a chair, there may never be a good time for it. You just have to take the leap. Sometimes you just have to apply and see how it goes. You might feel ready, but when you are actually in practice, you might not be ready and that's okay. So the thing is, and also chairing is not necessarily for everyone, but it's worth a try. It's definitely worth a try and you might end up really liking it. So I would say that don't beat it until you try it and chairing is definitely one of it. You might not even think of yourself as someone who is, oh, look at me, I can be a chair, but you might turn out to be one of a really good, enjoyable chair. So definitely try it, I would say. And also, I think it's, it's uh, important to keep in mind uh, that the experience is very different as a participant compared to the chair. As a chair, you're not as involved in the content side of things of the simulation. Uh, for example, like you're not proposing any amendments, you're not, you know, in, in active in any of the political discussions, but you are, for example, also part of the organizing team to some degree in that you're helping to implement the timetable, that you're in constant contact with them, how to how the rest of the day is going to go, when is lunch going to be, you know, how things, because you are, you are the ones that participants are going to ask these questions to, and you're going to, you know, announce it to them at the end of the session and all of these things. So it's, it's a very fun kind of in-between experience between um, being a participant and being an organizer, like a logistical organizer also. It's just, uh, yeah, I think uh, as, as Yogam said, uh, it, it might not be for everyone, but it's definitely worth, worth a try. And I think there's a lot to like about it. Um, so I would really recommend it uh, to all of you 
And although we're going to have to wrap up um, this webinar soon, you can always approach us, uh, the three of us. Uh, unfortunately, the fourth chair, Frank, was not able to be here because of other commitments. Uh, but you can find us uh, via the MU uh, Strasbourg social media. Uh, they can forward uh, your questions to us. So if you have any, any doubts or any specific questions that maybe we weren't able to address today, uh, you'll always uh, find someone who's able to help you out and, and happy to discuss with you in the MEU network. Yeah, so I think we can conclude here this uh, crash course. Thank you so much to Yogam and Christine uh, for participating and also to the viewers. And again, if you have any question, uh, just approach us. Uh, I think we, the, the, both the four of us, uh, Frank included, uh, we're going to be more than happy to, 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 to answer, or at least to try to answer to your questions. Uh, with that said, we are going to close the call. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for being here today. And uh, see you soon, hopefully, in uh, Strasbourg. Bye-bye.